Hello everyone. I had the pleasure to sit next to Mika yesterday and just to find out that I'm the one who comes after him. So first disclaimer, uh, if you're looking for flashy VR, you're going to be disappointed. I'm a researcher. We use VR. We don't create it. Um, now let's start. This quote from Lao Tse says, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. But what if the journey is not a thousand miles, but 250 million miles? And what if that first step doesn't go outward, but inward? Oops, this is too fast. <laughs> So, in 2030, NASA will send a manned spaceship to Mars. Um, this means uh, it's not exactly a trip from uh, Berlin to London, right? This is, um, it's, it's going to require some planning from our part to, to go to Mars. We're going to plan for the next 20 years. It's also going to be much more expensive going to cost us over 100 billion dollars. Um, we have to prepare for a trip like that, uh, and um, um, build the spaceship, build the mass mobile, but most importantly we have to find six individuals that are our most brightest and most resilient ones. Can you imagine what it will be like to be in a confined space with five other people, with basically no privacy, nothing that tells you what time of day it is, no weather, no season, no sounds. You're gonna be in this confined space for two and a half years, and you have to work together as a team, making a very important decision under extreme stress. These are pretty extreme conditions, right? In fact, the kind of conditions that sci-fi movies are made out of, like Interstellar or The Martian. So how many of you have seen both movies? So the 10 of you know that Matt Damon played an actor in both of those movies. Right? In one, in Interstellar, he was portrayed as somebody who was not psychologically healthy, who lost track of reality, was living in isolation, he turned on his fellow crew members and tried to kill them. In the other one, in The Martian, he was portrayed, Matt Damon portrayed the character of that astronaut as highly resilient. He was living also in isolation, but was able to survive all on his own in Mars, planting a vegetable garden. Now, both of those scenarios are pretty unlikely, but Maybe something in, the, in between is possible. So how are we going to find out if we don't go nuts on our way to Mars? Or we can ask them questions like these. How would you answer them? I would answer 10, no matter when you ask me. <laughs> this is in fact how a lot of research in the area of human performance and behavioral health has been carried out in the past. We use survey responses to, act, to make assessments about mental health status. Now this comes with a whole lot of problems using survey responses. People are not going to make responses, especially over long periods of time, but it's also not the most reliable assessment. So what we are trying to do, the company that I work for, what we have done in the past over the last eight years, is come up with automated and non-intrusive ways to make assessments about somebody's mental health without relying on just physiological measures or relying on self-report. This is in fact um, one of the gaps that has been identified. So NASA puts out a so-called roadmap where they are um, explaining what kind of technological innovations are necessary for future Mars missions. And we fall with our project in the uh, so-called behavioral health domain. There is, of course, a very known risk that there is performance decrements due to inadequate cooperation, coordination, communication, and psychological adaptation within the team. So the team dynamics 
are very important, not just the individual's health, but also that these teams can work together. So how are we going to do this? I guess the porn talk is over. <laughs> We do this by um, using so-called analog studies. So NASA is finding a bunch of projects that are trying to simulate the experience of future space missions. There's projects like a bed rest study where people are put into bed for four months with their head tilted backwards by six degrees. They're not allowed to get up at any point during those four months. They even have to exercise, as you can see here, this is a treadmill, while being in a vertical position. We put them in submarines at the bottom of the ocean, we sent them to the Antarctica, or we put domes on the deserted parts of Hawaii, on the main island, this is the high sea study, trying, that just looks like Mars, and we have people, six individuals live in there for eight or 12 months. This is in fact the ongoing study, and we are still collecting data. Now, what we do in all of these studies is have our subjects write journal entries, daily journal entries. And what we then do with these journal entries is that we are uh, performing a sophisticated language analysis. So we take these texts that we get, see? So we have a lot of text and text corpora. We feed this text into the black box of computer algorithms and then look at the results when they come out. Now it turns out that language is actually a very sensitive and very quantifiable metric to make mental health assessments because cognitive stress shows in language long before symptoms manifest. But language is also a window into our mind and these algorithms are able to read between those lines. Um, we are able, uh, the words we use, the frequency, how much politeness we use, how many pronouns, how depressed our language is, all these things can tell us something about a person's personality, their general disposition, or their <coughs> mental health status. So what we do in these uh, computer algorithm developments, that I'm not exactly a part of the computer scientists that do this, is we are identifying concepts of interest, of, of psychological states of interest, and then we are matching them with specific techniques and methods. So what you see here in the next slide is an outcome of, uh, so of an analysis called latent and mental semantic analysis. And these are not just word clouds, these are emotional spaces, more or less. Uh, so what you see on um, this side, on the left, on the left side, is the semantic space or the the space of the latent relationships between words um, of subjects that are not doing so well. While on the right side, you see a representation of happier people. And this difference, and the information that is contained here is that persons who are happier tend to focus more on you and are not so self-focused. They write about things like friends, um, family, and they're more focused on the present. Uh, thankfulness is also a, a very big one, and play and games. Now, the not so happy fellows, they are much more focused on the past, they're much more focused on themselves, and they also write more about bodily complaints, like headaches and uh, physical discomfort. We want to send Matt Damon in the Martian, right? Not interstellar. Not working. So, oh, but this was working too fast. <laughs> um, now, journal entries are great, right? There's a lot of language, but our communication traditionally has happened in social settings. We sit together, we tell stories to each other. Today, we have digital representation of these social interactions. Right? The stories themselves hasn't, haven't changed that much, but the context or the way we tell those stories has changed quite a bit. 
This is of course great for us researchers because we cannot only we cannot only uh, study the communication; we also study the human behavior in those virtual spaces. So we, in this case, we have worked on a project on a VR project. Now we are finally getting to the VR part, um, where we have created a virtual reality environment for astronauts in order to counteract the um, problems of social isolation and sensory monotony. So in our studies, we have tested how well this is going to work. These subjects in these so-called analog studies that I explained before, uh, going into the virtual spaces, they can explore, they can walk along the beach, they can see nature, they can feel it, they can hear it. Um, they can also go and just sit on the sofa in their virtual home, away from home, while being in a small isolated environment. We've also worked on technology in order to um, counteract, in order to come by the problem of asynchronous communication forgot to mention it earlier, there's going to be a communication delay once we are out there um, of 20 minutes one way. So once you ask a question, it's going to take 20 minutes until you get a response and so forth. So through this virtual ecosystem, our technology allows you to have the experience as if you're talking to your loved ones on Earth. And this has shown to, in fact, decrease uh, the feeling of isolation and sensory monotony and increase the feeling of closeness. Now, VR is great, but, and experiencing VR is great, but VR can also be used uh, to study behavior. And we are not only a social being, we are also a very playful being. Play being playful is a very natural state for us. It gives us joy. It's also very hard to be depressed and aggressive and playful at the same time. So we're having our crew members uh, play a game that we have developed that is called Mental Park. It's a strategic puzzle game. And we are studying the behaviors, and they have different choices of behaviors they can make. They can choose immoral behaviors, like stealing or block away, or they can also take the perspective of one of their fellow crew members. And the team dynamics often, when teams work together, they start to mirror each other's behavior. So these are all things that we can observe. And the interesting thing about these behaviors is that these are dependent on contextual environment or influenced by contextual environment, such as social bonds, how many resources you have left for self-control, um, perceived stress, which is time. So here at the bottom you see that this is the problem they are uh, faced with, and then you see that what the actual solution is like, and then they have to come up with a solution. This was developed community. So what are the takeaways? I hope I was able to convey to you that language is indeed a very good way to provide a quantifiable signal of mental health independent of physiological metrics. There's of course a lot of uh, other biometrics being collected by other investigators in these studies. I mean, it's clear that there's physiological changes, but the physiological changes out in space are not well understood, so we have to be able to fall back on much more simpler methods in order to uh, help each other, like in order for the crew members to help each other making like assessments about their mental well-being. VR is a fantastic way to um, decrease the social feeling of social isolation, but it's also a great way to provide um, for us researchers a way to monitor behavior. Um, and also for the crew members themselves to um, engage in play for, in, 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 engage in play and feel better. Like the play increases the cooperation. Now, when Lao Tse said 2,500 years ago that a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step, he probably didn't think of a Mars mission. But he did ask us to go on an adventure. Going to Mars is probably the biggest adventure that humankind will undertake. Right? But it's also the greatest journey inward. Going out there, we might find out what our limitations as a human species are, where we come from, what we are capable of, and maybe even find out if we are alone. Thank you. If you want to get in contact, for some reason it's not cooperating. Um,
Depends on the site. Depends on where. Um, How can they get in contact with you? Well, it's on that slide, and then you can take a, a picture of that slide. It would show up. I mean, we are generally always working with um, you know, um, academics and other industry. There you go. Uh, if you want to find out more about these studies, there's one that is still ongoing that is called High Seas. If you want to get in contact, please email me. Um, we are always happy to collaborate with um, academics and other industry experts. Thank you.